Today, as you listen to this teaching by Pastors Ralph and Joanne Hone, we hope you'll enjoy it and learn some practical ways to walk into the awesome life God has for you. For more information and for more free teaching, visit our website, www.tapintothesource.com. All right, thank you so much. God is so good. Did you like that video? What an awesome testimony. One part that she shared with us when she first gave us that testimony is that the teacher actually called her on a Friday night at home to share the good news with her, to give her the report that the doctor said that she was healed. And she was like, what? What? Who is this? (laughs) So it was so cool, but it just touched our heart. We thought no better way to translate that message of love and hope to you guys with just hearing it directly from her. I mean, we can, we can communicate it to you, but no better way to hear it directly from her. So we were definitely excited to, to share that with you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. Say this with me. Say, my heart is ready. My mind is alert to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, I am excited to be back and, and sharing with you guys uh, the last couple times I had the opportunity to speak, I started in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It says, these three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So I spoke on faith. We touched on that. Talked about what faith is, the trust, the full trust and confidence in God. One of my favorite verses of faith says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. So we spent a a good time studying that, looking at what faith is and how we walk by faith. And then we touched on hope, and the biblical view that I love is it's an earnest expectation. What are we expecting from God? What are we believing that God is going to do for us, through us, and in in our lives? In Jeremiah 29, 11, this is one of our, our key verses at the church here. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a hope and a future. Or a future and a hope, whichever way you like to say it. But that hope, that earnest expectation of the things that God has for us and the plans that he has for us and the things that he wants to do. So the last one, of course, the greatest of these, of the three, is love. Okay. But the cool thing about love, or the challenge of it, however you want to look at it, is it's it's all throughout the Bible. The whole Bible is literally a love letter that God has written to us. Everything that he does, he does out of love and compassion for us. So I'll just make a a little confession here. I've never really taught on love itself. And so as as God challenged me with this to bring this forth, I was like, okay, God, this has got to be then from you. Amen? Amen. All right, so started out into this journey of just listening what God wanted for me, what he wanted me to share, and he showed me this after the, the first night. I just said, okay, God, just open my eyes. What, what is it that you would like me to bring forth and share? And he showed me this. He showed me body, soul, and spirit. I'm like, okay, well, how does that tie in with love? Well, you have faith, hope, and love, body, soul, and spirit, okay? Faith is an action from our body. We walk by faith. We step out in faith. When Peter got out of the boat, he stepped out on the water. He took that action of faith. He took that action in the body to step out. Hope is an expectation, that earnest expectation of promise of things to come. So it's an expectation where? In our soul, in our mind. We, the thing we, get, we see that promise that's in our heart, we see that promise of that thing that he wants for us to have. So that expectation or that hope is in our soul. And love, where does love reside? It's the foundation in our spirit. So everything that we do has to be founded from the spirit. We are truly more spirit beings than we are physical body. We all understand that we live in this body, we possess a soul, but we are spirit beings like God. We are made in his likeness, in his image, and one day we'll be in heaven with him at the, in, our, in our time, okay? So the foundation of our spirit has to be love. Look at Romans 5.5. 5. I love this verse. It says that, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. 
another place also known as our spirit, in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Notice that it says that love was not poured out in our body. Love was not poured out in our soul, but it was poured out where? In our hearts, in our spirit. So we have to have that love. We have to have that love that's poured out in our heart in order for us to be able to operate and fully function in the love of God and what he wants for us. So what happens, what happens when we express love from a wrong foundation? What happens when we try to express love from our body? What do we get? We get lust, lust of the flesh. We try to do things physical, and that's not the true foundation of love. And with that, I just want to challenge you young people. You know, today's society and everything you see is all the physical. It's all flesh contact. It's all, well, how do I need to look? How do I need to appear? And then to get into a relationship, true love, let me just say this, true love, young people, will protect your purity. True love will protect the physical purity and the emotional purity of who you are. True love is that foundation that says, no matter what, I'm going to protect you because that's what God always comes back and does. Love from the soul, where does that lead us? Love from the soul will lead us into manipulation, control, mind games, trying to play with people's mind, try to get them to do what you want because you're trying to get them to love you. But that never works. In the end, that always leads to struggle and complication. And in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, and I'm sorry I don't have them posted for you up here, but it says, if, you could, if I could speak with all the languages of the earth and angels, but don't have love, but don't love others, I will only be a noisy gong and a clinging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and if I understand all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I give everything to the poor and even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Do you guys really grasp what he's saying here? Understand what he's saying, that you could be a person, you could be a church full of faith, seeing miracles, seeing things happen. But if the foundation of love isn't there, then what do you have? You have nothing. You gain nothing. So any person, any church truly operating those things has to have a foundation of love with it. When Jamie and I were first learning about faith and attending a church up north, the teaching on faith was great, but it became very evident that that foundation of love was not there, and the church eventually just struggled and, and, and didn't exist anymore. So you have to have that foundation of faith. And that's one thing I will say for this church. When we first came here, there was such a presence of love, such a presence of connection right from the beginning. And quite frankly, we, we came one time and have never stopped. <laughs> so it, we love this church and the pastor's hearts as you hear them speak and the things that they come forth with. It's out of the love of the Father, the love of the God coming from, from their heart. And it's a very, very safe place. The best way I like to define that in today's language, summarizing that 1 Corinthians 13 there, people think, you know, you're just all that in a bag of chips. Anybody hear that before? Okay, if you think that, but you don't have that foundation of love, then you don't really have anything. So Jesus was asked, what is the most important commandment? In Mark 12, 28, it says, one of the teachers of the religious law was standing there Listening to the debate, he realized that Jesus answered well, so he asked, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? 29, Jesus replied, The most important command is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is one and, is one and only Lord. Verse 30 says, And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And there again, we see the spirit, soul, and body loving with all, all three of those. But then he goes on to say, the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what's interesting when he talks about these commandments, when we think of commandments, what's the first thing we go back to? The Ten Commandments. 
Now, the first one he gives there says to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength was actually spoken just after the Ten Commandments were given. So it kind of summarized all that. But what's interesting, if you look at the next one, when he says to love your neighbor as yourself, that was actually given back before the Ten Commandments came out. So he's pulling these two together and emphasizing the love. And I like what it says in Matthew 22. This ties these two together. In Matthew 22:40, and this was from Matthew coming directly after that same statement in Mark. He says, the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So what is that saying? All of the law, that's the written word. The prophets are the spoken word. And all of these, all of these things tie back to what? The foundation of love. To love the Lord your God, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's interesting that Jesus gives us a new commandment. In the book of John, Jesus is in the upper room with the disciples. He knows that his time is coming near, and he wants to leave his, leave his disciples with something very important. Make sure they have a full understanding and knowledge of who they are and what they're to do moving forward. So in, in, first, in John 13, verse 34, it says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove that the world, to the world, that you are my disciples. So he stops and he says, you know what, guys? This is how people are going to know what real love is. You're going to show them by loving one another. But I love what he says there. He says, to love each other just as I have loved you. So how did Jesus, how did Jesus show his disciples how to love each other? What kind of example did he give to them? Well, if we take a step back in that very same chapter, in John 13, it talks about when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. So we're going to take a dive and, and look into this. In John 13, at verse 3, it says, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. Notice what it says in the very first two words. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that the Father had given him all authority okay Jesus knew at this point he had a full revelation of who he was he had a full revelation of knowing what his mission was what his call was what God's plan was for him to accomplish and to do but he also had a full revelation of the love that he was carrying with him that he needed to to take to the world of what he needed to do same goes for us. We need to have a full revelation of knowing who Christ is in us. Just as we were talking about doing things with great faith, but if we don't know the revelation of Christ in us to do those things of great faith, then we do them on our own, right? We have to know who Christ is in us in that full revelation of who he is in order to go forth and show that true love of God. So he says this, knowing that he has full authority of everything and that he was from God and he would return to God. Then he goes up in verse 4. It says, so he got up from the table, he took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around him. So let me ask you this. If Jesus just makes this statement or just has this full revelation of who he is and the authority that he has, why does he step down to a place of serving? Do you see the transition that just took place there? What normally would have happened or what should have made sense to the disciples is what? He has the authority. They should be serving him, right? Right? But in turn, he flips that around right to them and says that he gets up and he does this. What was he showing them? What was he demonstrating to them? That foundation of love 
that he was carrying in him. Now, I love Peter. You know, he's one of those funny guys in the Bible who just always kind of comes back at things with you. And know, you know, he's a, what I would say an external processor. <laughs> he likes to verbally communicate sometimes. So it says, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Stop right there. What's the first word that he says? Lord. What is he demonstrating? What is he recognizing about Jesus? That he is the Lord, that he has the authority. So Peter is really saying, Lord, you're the, you're the master. I should be doing this for you. Why are you doing this for us? Why are you doing this to me? Right? I like Peter's heart here because he was really wanting to say, I should be doing this for you, not for me. Okay? <clears throat> Jesus replied, you do not understand how I'm going, how I, what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. What was Jesus saying here? Peter needed that connection with the Father. He needed to make sure he was connected to that love. Because when Jesus stepped down from his place of authority, even right there before them to say, hey, I'm stepping down and I'm going to demonstrate what love is to you. And I'm going to show you this by serving you and showing you what the Father's heart is. Amen? But Peter was not quite getting that connection. So Peter exclaims, exclaims back, and I love this, in verse 9, he says, well, then don't just wash, then wash my hands, my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. He's like, man, if you're going to do it, then boom, do it all, right? Don't just stop there, man. Go for the whole thing. Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for his feet to be entirely clean. And I ask God, what, what, is, what is really ta- transpiring here? What is really taking place? Okay? And I think at the core essence, it talks about, you know, when you receive Christ, you have Christ in you. And there's going to be times we mess up and we need to ask for forgiveness. An example of washing our feet. Okay? But even for Peter, it was almost a twofold where he needed to be, to be able to know that forgiveness needs to be shown but forgiveness also needs to be received. You know, it's, it's easy sometimes to expect somebody to say, man, you messed up. You did something to me bad. You need to say you're sorry or make them come forward. But what happens sometimes they do that, and what do we do? We still hold on to it. We still carry that with us, and we aren't willing to let that go. But we have to be willing to say, you know what? I forgive you. And move, and move past that. Be able to have forgiveness, receive forgiveness, and show forgiveness at the same time. So after washing their feet, he put on his robe and sat down and said, Do you understand what I am doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that is what I am. Again, he had that place of authority, and they recognized that, but he also stepped down to show them Love. And since I, your teacher, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done. And what was that new commandment that he gave to them? Love each other, right? Just as I love you. So he's saying to them, listen, to show that love from a true foundation of love. You can help one another. You can help serve one another. You can do things for one another. I mean, how humbling is it to be able to wash somebody's feet? I know my, my girl loves her feet rubbed all the time, right? But that's a little different than washing feet, but it's all the same, right? <laughs> but to humble yourself to the point where you, you put yourself into a position of not elevating yourself, but attaching to that, saying, hey, I'm going to love you and I'm going to serve you in a way that's going to benefit you. Because it really wasn't about washing feet, was it? It was about forgiveness. It was about helping that person to walk the entirety of their life in a place that God has for them. You see, people that come alongside you, 
They don't need your criticism. They need your forgiveness. They need your support, and they need your love to help build them up and to enable them to go out and to do greater things. We're to sharpen one another. And Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron. You notice it doesn't say, as a stone sharpens iron, as iron sharpens iron. That means two like metals sharpening one another. And you're purely just sharpening the fine tips of the end of the blade. So we're building one another up. We're all together in the same race, running the same direction, running to God to do great things. So we encourage one another, we love one another, and we build one another up. Amen? Amen. Okay, so the new commandment. So how do we walk in love? I'm going to leave you with three points today. Walking in love. Number one, stay connected to the Father. Sounds easy, but not always so easy, right? Stay connected to the Father. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 says, We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid of the day of judgment, but we will face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. There's a lot in this verse, and I love this verse. Living with God, living in God, having that foundation of love. Because when we have that foundation of love in us, we can literally, as it said there, like live like Jesus lives in this world. You know, no matter what's going on around, staying connected to God, staying in that place of love. You know, we've shared our testimony before, Jamie and I. We went through some real hard times when we first moved down here back in 2008, 9 and 10 time frame. But, you know, I could wake up every day and have that foundation of the Father within me and knowing no matter what was going on in the world or our personal circumstances, that his love was going to carry us through. And as we grasped things, we kept caught on to things, as we learned, because we had to learn through that. We had to go through that trial of learning to know what God had for us. But I love to be able to wake up and just no matter what, that foundation of love, which is so strong, will carry us through those situations. So our foundation, what else does it say there? It says our foundation of love is perfected. So we grow, our love is perfected. With that spirit of God's love in us, we can continue to love and grow and have that perfection of love growing in us. Later in, in uh, John chapter 14, it talks about Jesus said that greater things you will do in this world Right? How are we going to do greater things than Jesus did? Because we stay connected to the Father. Every time Jesus was challenged with something, well, where'd you get that from? Well, that's what God told me. I only do what the Father says. I only do what the Father does. I only do what the Father wants me to do. And when we walk in that place of love, we do as the Father does, we will be able to do great things like Jesus did. Number two, forgive. You touched on this a little bit earlier. But number two, how do we walk in love? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 says, Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So forgiveness, forgiving one another. But what is the challenge that we have? What is that last thing it said there of his devices, the enemy's devices? How often do we come under attack with things? How often do we allow our emotions, right? When we try to love from our soul, how often do we allow emotions to take over versus allowing the love of God to take over? In second, or excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, it lists some of the points of these Enemies' devices. Envy. Is it easy to get envious of someone else that's doing really well? Yeah. Boasting. You know, maybe something great has happened for you, and you start to want to boast about that. What do we boast about? God's love. We boast about what God has done for us. Pride. Dishonor. You know, we live in a society of a lot of dishonor, and it's really, really sad because there's so many 
blessings and so many things that come along with honoring those that are in our authority. Even when the people in authority aren't doing what's right, when we still honor them, it blesses us and allows God to work out the situation to take care of whatever that thing is. Self-seeking, record of wrongs. How often is it that we keep record of the wrongs? Oh, man, can you believe what this guy did to me? He did it again and again. I love the uh, little comic I just seen here this, this last week, you know, and uh, Jesus told him, how often are you supposed to forgive? Seven times, 70 times, right? And I love the disciples in the background. It's like, oh, I hate math. It's easier just to forgive. <laughs> I know my kids love that one. We can develop an algebraic equation to help them figure that out, right? <laughs> So again, forgive. If we don't forgive, we allow these devices that the enemy plays out there, we allow these devices to rise up. So when we forgive, what do we do? We nix the power of those devices. We say, no, these devices can't happen. These devices can't take place because I'm going to forgive and I'm going to walk in love. I'm going to walk in love to show them what true discipleship is. I'll just encourage you. We have small groups on Wednesdays, and one of them we're doing is uh, on the Beta Satan, which is a great series. If you haven't gone through that, it deals with offense, forgiveness. Uh, it's a great series. Check it out. Get plugged in. Last one, point number three, how do we walk in love? Have agape love. Agape love, a lot of us hear that. You know, it's, it's the deepest love that God can have. I love this paraphrase. Simply this, agape love is I will love you regardless I will love you regardless of what you say back to me. I will love you regardless of how you treat me. I will, I will love you regardless of how great you become, right? We always think of the negative things that we got to deal with, but what about the positive things? What if, what if someone just blows it off the charts and they just, God blesses them and God takes them places that you wanted to be? God takes them and does something for them and blesses them financially, spiritually, whatever it is, they, they get blessed to the point where, well, what about me? Oh, no, man, love them regardless and love them in the place that they're in. Amen? Unconditional love. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That unconditional love that we can have for others. That unconditional love that we can portray and, and push towards others and share that love with them. And I'll leave you with this. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. I love the very first part of it. It says that love never fails. Say that with me. Love never fails. Simple words, but we have to understand when it's the foundation of our spirit, it's going to go where? It's going to push up into our minds. It's going to affect the way we think. It's going to affect the way we talk. It's going to affect everything that was within us. And when it pushes up from our spirit to our soul, it's going to come out of our body. Everything that we portray, everything that we act, everything that we want to do, and even to the steps of faith, even to our hope and expectations. Because when the expectation is coming from the love of God, saying that God promised this for me. He wants this for me, not that I can just be blessed, but I can be a blessing to somebody else, that I can step out and see great things happen on their behalf, that I can lay hands on the sick. Even the video that we watched of the, of the young girl who prayed for her school teacher, just, just to have the love. You know, she first thing she says when she got confirmation that, that she did have leukemia, that she was diagnosed with that, she said, I felt sad. I was so sorry. That's the love. That's love and compassion saying, wow, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to stand in faith for you. Someone that wasn't even going to church and someone that didn't even know Christ and, and this young person says, I'm going to pray for you. Then they get that call on a Friday night saying, I'm healed. I'm healed. Amen. Yes. That is the love pushing forward, but it has to start from a foundation of love that traps the mind, and then the body follows suit with it. Love never fails. 
So no matter what you're walking through, you know, some of you may be in a place now where you're saying, man, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm, I'm in a tough place. You know, things financially aren't good. Things health-wise aren't good. Love never fails. Christ never gave up on us. Even while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He provided a way, even when we didn't deserve it, even when we didn't know we needed it, even when we didn't know there was a way out, he still provided a way for us. And when we allow that love, that love that never fails to enter in, we'll not only be healed on the inside and be able to walk in our place, but then we'll be victorious on the outside. And we'll be able to step out and help others see the kingdom of God completely fulfilled. So how do we walk in love? Stay connected to the Father. Forgive and have that agape love, that love that says, no matter what you're walking through, I'm going to love you. Have that kind of love that says, no matter where you are, I'm going to love you. All of us are on a different place. All of us are on a different journey. And all of us need that love connection. You know, some of you may be here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior. You know, maybe you've never really felt that love connection. Maybe you've never felt that place of saying, yes, I have the Father. I have his love and his love is in me. It's very simple. You know, Jesus did all the work. He died in our place. The Bible says, again, I mentioned earlier, that as when we were yet sinners, he died for us. So he makes it so simple. And like receiving, we, we always use this illustration with the kids. It's like receiving a Christmas gift. Do you have to do something to earn that gift, that gift of love that God gave to us? No, you just have to simply receive it. The Bible says in about Romans 10, 9, it says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. And I love that word saved because it doesn't just mean you got a free ticket to heaven, but that means your bodies are made whole, your bodies are made complete, everything that was broken is made whole and complete. So we're going to pray together. I'm going to ask you guys just to bow your heads, close your eyes, and we're going to pray together. And if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you've never allowed that love, that agape love from Christ to enter in, we're going to give you guys that opportunity to do that this morning. Would you all pray with me and say, Father, I confess Jesus is Lord. I believe that Jesus died for me. I receive that forgiveness today. I thank you for your love, Lord, in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. For more free teaching and information about The Source, please go to www.tapintothesource.com.